What's up, guys? Benjamin Kidani here from NBA Australia, and we're back again to talk everything The Last Dance in The Last Dance Review. Episodes 9 and 10 dropped on Netflix on Monday night here in Australia, so we're joined by two very special guests to break everything down. You know him, the main man, Lee Ellis from The Athletic and No Dunks. How you doing, Lee? Fine, thanks, but Ahmad Rashad is the main man, of course. <laughs> You're my main man. Uh, yeah, and another uh, very special guest uh, joining us today, New Zealand Warriors star, Roger Tuovasashek, a huge Hoops fan in his own right. Thanks for joining us today, Roger. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to talk about it. And uh, before we get started, man, how's, uh, how's everything been with you during this, uh, this quarantine period and, and getting your preparations ready for the NRL season to return uh, in a couple of weeks' time? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, um, interesting start to the season for us. We, um, we played two games and now we're, we're having a, we had a bit of a break with the COVID-19 and now we're relocated to Australia. So, yeah, the prep has been different, but, you know, the boys are still locked in and ready to go. And uh, we've been here in Tamworth, uh, New South Wales, just um, training during our quarantine, getting ready for um, our first game in two weeks away. So excited to get back into it. Uh, excited to have you guys back out on the field, man. And uh, and, and you mentioned to me off air that uh, the last dance has kind of taken over the locker room with the uh, with the Warriors team. Has that pretty much been the topic of conversation for the last few weeks? Yeah, pretty much. The boys just can't get enough, you know. Just there's a lot of big um, hoop fans in our team, and MJ is right at the top of all of that. So um, when that came out, we just constantly get together and watch it. So yeah, loving the, that that doco, and, and the boys are that's something to talk about. Besides Fortnite, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, man. Well, we'll get to, we'll get straight into. It. We obviously had episodes nine and ten drop uh, on Monday night, and I guess the crescendo of of the last dance is that uh, that ninety eight final series, and uh, and going back and kind of watching, uh, I guess watching that from MJ's perspective and everything that kind of unfolded around there. What did you what did you take away? I guess from that, I mean, the last shot and 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 just that performance to to close out his Bulls career like that. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. Or like right from the start of that that last episode when he, they spoke about Jordan, his best gift is in the moment. He he's in the he's present and he just plays what's in front of him. He doesn't worry about missing shots or failure. So, and you can just see it right from that that last shot when he's he's fatigued, he's exhausted. And he says it himself, but he just finds a way. He just goes to a different place, and that's why he's he's a great player and he's a legend because you know only tough players can can go to different places and. And yeah, that's something that I truly admire from from his game and the way he was able to pull it off in big in the big stage like that. And, and Scotty right next to him with a broken back and still wobbling around getting it done. And yeah, that team was it was crazy. I think uh, I think the the quote that stood out was uh, was why would I worry about a shot uh, that I why, why would I worry about missing a shot that I haven't taken? And and that that kind of just you know really just shows you just how much confidence that uh, that he was playing with. I'll, I'll, I'll throw to you, Lee, in, the, in, the, in that last episode there, um, obviously with that, that, that big performance there in the, in the 98 finals. What, what did you take away from, from watching that last night? Well, I think uh, as Roger sort of alluded to there, it was more about mental strength than physical strength because you could see he was just exhausted. I mean, he's at the end of his career as well and he just needed to find something in that last minute of play to win his team the championship because I, 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 you know, really think that if the Bulls lose game six, they probably lose game seven too because Jordan would have been fatigued beyond, you know, anything else and Pippen may not have even played. So Jordan almost sort of had to find something to be like, all right, this is it. It's all, all or nothing right now. And he was able to, and you could just see he was just, you know, shoulder slump, physically completely drained, you know, that had that seven game series against the Pacers as well. And they only had two days before the series started there against Chicago, uh, against uh, Utah. And, you know, in that moment, a lot of athletes, it's not about, you know, who's the strongest or the fastest or who can jump the highest. It's about who's got that mental ability to just get themselves over the line. And, you know, it started before that shot. It was that layup that he hit. He drives inside, gets a high percentage basket. And then on the next play, he's still mentally uh, sharp enough to make that incredible defensive play on Palm alone, like the stamina, yeah, yeah. you know, mental stamina is uh, is what really set him apart. And Carl alone, I mean, he was a fantastic player, big player. And if he just gets that ball and is able to draw a foul or go inside and get a basket, the Jazz, you know, more than likely win that game. But instead, Michael's able to make that huge play, take a gamble, but it's worth it, and then go down the other end and then finish off the play. And then even then, they've still got to get a stop. And uh, John Stockton gets a good look after that. 
Um, but but I, I just look at that, and and Jordan sort of talked about that too in the in the final scene there, where he said, you know, physically I wasn't as good as I uh, you know as it was when I'm young, but mentally he's just learned the game and he's he's more experienced, and that's why he really wanted to have another shot at going at four in a row and seven overall because he felt mentally he was just better still than than most players in the NBA. So um, I think it's really important to uh, to take that out of it. That again, you know, you you can you can be the the guy who lifts the most weights and who can run the fastest. But if your mental game is missing, uh, then it just changes everything because uh, Michael, again, showed that, that he, he was able to, to deliver in the moment. And, uh, and especially, I guess, as you said, Lee, with that, that sort of three-play sequence on, 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 on both ends, I'll, I'll go to you, Roger. Seeing MJ that late in a game after... You know, when you count up everything in the series, everything in his career, and then to be able to still be locked in like that at the end of a game and and and, and pull that off, what, what did that kind of, I guess, did it show you anything different about MJ or was it very much, I guess, what, what we already knew? Yeah, that's um, one thing that sort of stood out for me was the detail he had on 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 the players that he was facing. Uh, when he was talking about, like, it was a back in the fourth quarter, but he he's in his mind saying, I know how Bill Russell plays. He's on his toes. He's going to lean. I'm going to get him with this. And then he, and they're still on Carl Malone. He goes, I know the play that they're going to run. They ran it a couple of times. Like that detail to still have that, that, de- that preparation that he, you know, he's been doing his video. He's been watching games and he's taking it to right to the, the last quarter. And, you know, it's all this um, preparation and, and video work that he's done beforehand. It's, it's coming, it's coming to big play in the last, you know, minute where he's, he's made Russell go because he knows he's on his toes and he's made that steal because he knows the play that they run. And that's, that's the big thing that stood out for me that he's constantly thinking about how he can make it work. And he's in the moment. He's not thinking, Oh man, I gotta, I just gotta win. I just gotta win. He still has details to how he's going to win. And that's what impresses me the most. And, and how like for me as well, on the other end of the floor, the jazz didn't try to double him or anything and just say, get the ball out of his hands, which if I'm the jazz, I'm like, I, I don't care who beats us as long as it's not Jordan, you know, like yeah. Pippen's, Pippen's man, you know, whoever just go out and double and say, yeah. get the ball, make him make the pass. Now, again, we saw Steve Kerr hit the big shot in game six of the 97 final. So, so other players yeah. were able to step up in the moment, but if I'm the opponent, I will take anyone else on Jordan's team a hundred times out of a hundred than Jordan in that moment. Yeah. And, and yeah. that, you know, again, I think that sort of works to Roger's point there that Jordan as fatigued as he was, was still able to be mentally in the game and make the right play. But then yep. the Utah Jazz themselves weren't really thinking, it seemed, on the other end of the floor. You know, Carl Malone, and, and, you know, I'm just speculating, but he might be sort of down on himself because he's just turned the ball over. But you can't think like that. You've got to, yeah. you've got to think aggressive. You've got to think, okay, what am I going to do to make the next play the right one? Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's easy now, 22 years later, sitting on a couch, it's like, oh, yeah, what's Carl Malone doing? But uh, yeah. in that moment, that's, again, what separates so many people and so many athletes, I think, that, that some are able to even elevate themselves when it, when it really, really uh, matters in that crucial moment. And, uh, and you touched on it there, Lee. Um, you know, obviously, MJ, you know, we saw him carry them through, you know, with, with, with his Scotty's injuries and that kind of thing. But a, a part of, of, of these last episodes that I quite enjoyed was the, was the segment on Steve Kerr. And, 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 you know, obviously, you had that moment there in the, in the 97 finals and, and seeing everything as far as his career and, and what he's gone on to achieve after that. Uh, Roger, when you look at, you know, the, the, the role players on, this, on, on these teams and the trust that, that, that Michael has in these guys, that they almost have to kind of prove it to him in practice that they're ready. But then, you know, in these game situations, you know, he's still able to say, okay, this guy's going to be here. This guy's going to be here. And, uh, and for Steve Kerr, you know, he's, he's got a nice little highlight reel out of that. Yeah. It's been, um, been crazy how the players around him have, have come in and, and put their hand up. They said, you know, I'm going to be a role player for MJ and, and Scotty and Roddy, and I'm going to play my part in and that's going to get us the championships. And they're real happy of it. But I think the best one is when you go back to uh, a couple of um, episodes um, and they all talk about M- when MJ spoke, he'd done everything he spoke about. He was leading a fitness. He was eating well. He was prepping well. So there was no reason for them not to feel as if they should, you know, play their role because MJ was doing everything he said. So, so you know, he was, he was leading from, from that aspect. And, and then so when Steve Kerr just had to play his part and when he had that, that winning shot, you know, that's when he gained his wings, what Jordan said. So the way that they all just 
they all blended each other, which is which makes a real champion team. And and MJ just does what he does. Mm. And and Jordan just showing uh, faith in his teammates in that crucial moment, you know, because that play to Kerr was designed. You know, you hear Jordan sort of talk about it, say they're going to double me. You be ready, catch the ball and shoot it. And and to put that trust in a teammate is so important because it wasn't always there with Jordan. You know, it took him some yeah. time to learn his teammates to trust them and to and to have faith in them. And I think, you know, he talked about as well when he and um, Kerr had that fight and they, you know, throwing punches at each other. But at least there was some respect that came out of that. Yep. And then you yep. see Steve Kerr, you know, uh, deliver in that crucial moment because Jordan showed that trust and that uh, faith in him. So, you know, Jordan was was clearly a guy who um, was, was hard to be around at times and he expected everyone to be at the best. But if you proved to him that you could play in those moments and you earned his respect, then he had complete and utter faith that you would you would deliver when you were called on um so you know leadership takes on all sorts of qualities and for jordan you know might not have been uh conventional at times but it certainly with the right players it pushed the right buttons and uh and delivered the results and uh and speaking of always uh you know performing uh on on the biggest stage it wouldn't be the last dance without uh dennis rodman uh making a great uh, (laughs) a great story arc in these episodes i mean I mean, we all knew that he went and, and, and wrestled with Stone Cold and NWR. I had no idea that was during the final. Does that does that seem crazy? Yeah, yeah. That is a massive no-no here in our in our world today. That is crazy. It's a you know the biggest the biggest stage of them all, the the grand final, the the big the big showdown, and he just goes off for a day or two just to you know go and wrestle and and drink and smoke and do this all on the side and everyone's getting ready for the big game it's yeah it's crazy but that it's funny because that's just Rodman right through the whole series and yeah it was just him and the way again you know the way that they allowed him to do that or maybe they didn't allow him they did yeah they I don't think they did allow him to do it (laughs) that's what makes it even funnier that you know Jackson when he was asked about it and and he's like (laughs) excused absence no it wasn't and then you know it's not like he just snuck off and was in you know like hiding somewhere I mean he was on national tv wrestling you know Hulk Hogan's making jokes about it yeah you can blow off practice and that um like I I just cannot imagine an equivalent in any sport uh, today you know whether it's rugby or or, uh, basketball or hockey or whatever whatever sport there's just no way something like that would, would happen. <laughs> but then, you know, Rodman came out, had six points, 14 rebounds, and they win the next game. And I think that's at least what Phil and Jordan and, and some of the other guys understood that Rodman, his body of work on the court was he always brought the energy. He always played his hardest. He always, you know, delivered as well. So he kind of was like, well, how, can, how angry can you be the guy who then goes out and yeah. performs? I mean... You know, it's uh, it's just just crazy. Yeah. You no, know, and he just turned turned up to practice there, and you could sort of see him at the back, and they're calling him Rodzilla. They're all laughing about it. Uh, just just an incredible moment in in um, you know in this in this dynasty. Yeah. He's right there in the middle of it, wrestling with Hulk Hogan and, and uh, Steve Austin. <laughs> it's awesome. There's no way, there is no way that would happen today. No. <laughs> so we we won't wow. see you ducking off to do any wrestling there, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not not you know, like Roger, that. Hey, Roger, why don't you just try it and just see what the reaction is? You know, just say, you know, like, like it's time it's time to mix things up a little bit here. I'm just going to go and yep. do something crazy in the middle of the week before a game. It's just, just you know what, see what happens. It might be you all good. What? I'm just going to go out there and, pl- and like Jordan play a bit of golf, you know, play play, and then I'll see you guys back here um, kick off and we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. that'll be crazy. <laughs> we got we got Roger now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and another part of these these last few episodes that, um, that I found quite interesting is we got to take a little bit of a, a closer look at a couple more of Jordan's opponents, obviously uh, Reggie Miller in, yep. the, in the Eastern Conference Finals. But those Jazz teams with Stockton and Malone, we, we sort of go back and, and especially watching the 97-98 Finals, which they uh, faced off against the Bulls. Uh, Lee, when, when you sort of look back at, at, at Stockton and Malone now, um, I guess through today's lens, and, and they're often, you know, almost not forgotten, but, but really underappreciated just how much of a tough time they gave MJ uh, in those finals. And, and, and that, that duo right there, it's, it, it's got to be one of the most, you know, effective, um, you know, one-two combos that we've seen. 
Oh, there's no question. I mean, you know, probably the best one too in terms of longevity that they were together and the the way that they were able to score and read each other and just play with each other. I mean, you know, Magic and Kareem and Michael and George, uh, Michael and Scotty obviously played a lot together and had more success. But in terms of just going out there and getting a bucket, the Stockton Malone pick and roll was virtually unguardable. Um, but uh, you know, a couple of things I noticed that um, you know the Jazz had plenty of chances in '97 and '98. To, to win games that they lost. You know, you go back to game one of 97, Carl Malone, it didn't, they didn't show it in the dock, but he misses two free throws before Jordan hits that game winner over Brian Russell. Okay, so that's, again, maybe they don't win that game anyway, but it's, an, it's a massive opportunity that they lose. And then game five, of course, with the, with the flu game, you know, Jordan's as sick as anything, and they aren't really able to take advantage of that. And then again, you go to game six in 98, Pippen's hurt, Jordan's exhausted, you know, the Jazz lead with 41 seconds to go and they lose, you know. So, like, it could have so easily sort of... You'd think at some point one of those sort of moments would have just sort of slipped the Jazz's way, but they never did. Um, you know, and again, maybe that's Jordan, maybe that's mental toughness. Maybe we just make those phrases up because we know the result. But in that crucial time, the Jazz, all they had to do was do one or two things right and they win the game yeah. and they weren't able to do it. Um, but then also when you look at that and John Stockton talked about it, like they never feared Jordan. They never sort of, you know, um, cause they've, their careers basically intertwined. Jordan came in in 84 and Stockton was 84 and Malone was 85. So they played their entire career together. Teammates on the dream team. They, they knew each other's games really, really well. Um, but the jazz, you know, for whatever reason in those crucial moments that could have swung a series, just weren't able to, to deliver. And, you know, someone like Dirk Nowitzki is a good um, comparison to both Stockton and Malone because Dirk had a, had a series in 2006 in the finals. They were two up on the Mavericks and they're up by 13 points with 12 minutes to go in game three. And they end up not only losing that game, but losing that series. And then Dirk, the next season, loses in the first round to the We Believe Warriors when he was the MVP and the, the Mavs won 67 games. If Dirk doesn't come back and win that championship in 2011... I think we sort of look at Dirk in the same way and say like, man, he had chances and he just couldn't, he couldn't get that, that one title. But do you see what happens when he does win that title? Now Dirk's like, we all love him and he's great. He's a Hall of Famer. And of course, Stockton and Malone are Hall of Famers. But the point is their resume doesn't have that championship to sort of solidify everything, yeah. you know? And um, so you kind of always look at no matter how good they were, they just were never able to quite get over the line even though they had brilliant teams for over a decade, mainly because they had two of the greatest players of all time. And, and, and for you, Roger, just sort of looking at those, those margins, it's those one or two players, those little things that you call it, you know, the Jazz just couldn't catch a break, um, you know, in, in any of those games when, when they really should have closed down. When you kind of see just how fine the margins are, you know, as an as a, as a, you know, athlete yourself, when you, when you kind of look at those moments and, and, and see the impact that Jordan had, and kind of taking yeah. that away from not only the Jazz, but so many guys that it's it's not necessarily, you know, the full body of work. It, it can just come down to those one or two plays and, and, and that can make the difference. Yeah, it's so true. And like Lee was saying, just the way that I, I think someone made a comment about um, the Bulls just had their championship DNA in them. They just knew how to win moments. And, and you know, you just, just, just where the Utah came off, they always started fast. They always started with 10, 15 points ahead. But... Again, you know, when it came down to that fourth quarter where it was big moments, I don't know how MJ and the, and the Bulls, they just found a way. And, you know, there's teams and players like that who just lift during the big stages and Stockton and, and Carl Malone, you know, they're great players, but they just couldn't, they just couldn't elevate when, when MJ elevated. And that's, that's where they got caught. And in our games today, these players in, in the NRL and in the sport that I play that, you know who loved that? Who loved those moments? And when and they go looking for it. So when their team is in that, in that that time where you got to make a hit, they just stand up because they really enjoy it. And like MJ, you know, he loves the challenge and he takes it every time. And everyone in the in the stadium knows who's going to take that big shot. And and he just he he loves it. He draws the energy from it. And yeah, it's just crazy to watch and it. it's inspiring. And you know, hopefully there's someone in our team who's ready to go. And and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear man it's good to hear um another another opponent we've got to look at um was the indiana Pacers in the eastern conference and and, and more specifically yep. reggie miller um i don't know if i've seen anyone approach a game against michael jordan with that much confidence what, what, what were your thoughts on uh on, on reggie's cameo in uh in, in episode nine lee 
Well, yeah, I mean, Reggie was another guy whose career, you know, largely crossed Michael's and, and you know, they were rivals um, for a lot of that time because, um, you know, Reggie was a, a trash talker and he was the sort of guy who did deliver in big moments. You know, he's had the, obviously, the eight and nine seconds moments, probably one of the most memorable. He's had the 25-point fourth quarter against the Knicks there too. So he's, he's the sort of guy who backed up a lot of his talk with big performances but another guy who just didn't have that championship to sort of, um, you know, validate his entire career, even though you don't need it. But, you know, in, when we talk about the best of all time, if you don't have a championship, it's just sort of, it's just one of those, you know, black eyes on your career, even though, you know, like it, it's crazy to sort of talk about that for a guy who's been super successful. But, you know, Reggie, again, that, that series, and, and I remember, you know, looking back at that and, and they talked about it off the top, you know, Rick Smith was like seven three seven four. You know, Anthony Dave, uh, Antonio Davis and Dale Davis, just two big, big, strong guys there. And then you had Reggie, had Travis Best as the point guard as well. Like, and they were so well coached by Larry Bird. Like, that was a tough, hungry, resilient team that, you know, were, were when you look at what the Bulls had been through, the Pacers were ready for a championship. And same sort of thing, you know, like that series was so close. The Bulls win the first two, Pacers win game three. Game four, of course, that Reggie push off on uh, Jordan. He hits that huge shot. And then you see Larry Bird not even happy almost after yeah. he hit that shot because he knows Larry's, Larry's hit shots after that, you know, with a second to go a million times in his career. So he knows the game's not over. And then Jordan nearly does put them up 3-1. Yeah. Excuse me, um, you know, the ball rims out there. And then, at the you know, the Pacers get it to seven games and they get to within you know, what, four or five points with, with five or six minutes to go in a, in a very tight game where it's like 88, 83 or something like that. And again, it's the same sort of thing as the Jazz, that all the Pacers need to do is make one or two slight changes to their play and perhaps they win that game seven and they go to the finals and they play the Utah Jazz and, and you know, the whole last dance doesn't even exist. Um, yep. But when the margins are just so fine, Jordan always seems to find a way just to get his nose in front and get his team over the line. And, uh, and, and Reggie's one of those players that, you know, a lot of people hated him. A lot of people loved him and he certainly did deliver for his team. But in that game seven, I think he didn't score in the last 16 minutes. So, you know, like for all the accolades and all the achievements that he's, um, you know, collected throughout his career, you kind of look at that and you think, wow, that's, that's again, just what separates the superstars like Reggie from the absolute super elite stars uh, like Michael. Yeah, just the way that he started off when um, he started off, uh, Reggie came out and he wanted to play tough and he came out and he was pushing and he wasn't afraid of Michael and he was there right throughout the, the series. But when, again, you know, when it gets down to the, the point, he just couldn't, he just couldn't keep, up, keep up that type of play and Jordan just goes above him and just finishes it off. And like you said, it's such a big separation between someone like Reggie and Michael because... Yeah, Michael stayed with it the whole way. He stays on top of his game the whole the yeah. whole way and Reggie just falls off the back end. And and remember as well, like Jordan's won five championships at that point and the hunger is still there. Like he's not satisfied. Reggie has never yeah. been, been to the finals at that point. He's been close with the paces. So you just imagine how different a lot of the times hunger is with athletes who have won. You know, Pat Riley talks about the hunger of more, the danger of like when players win a championship, sometimes they're like, you know what? that's good enough for me. I'm happy. And that they don't have that same drive and determination the following seasons. You know, Jordan, again, he's in the second of his um, three-peat tries. Game seven, if he, if he walks away from that game as, uh, you know, without a victory, it's like, well, he's still got his five championships, you know, and he's still the greatest ever, uh, most likely. You know, yeah, but he doesn't ever rest on that. He's like, no, no. I, I want six. I've got to have six. I will, you know, if I don't have six, I'm a complete failure. You know, that's a sort of mentality that he takes into it and um you know that that's a that's a huge thing because i think when the bulls beat the pistons back in 1991 and then the bulls went on to win the championship i think you could see even though the pistons were a little bit older then as well but you could see the hunger just wasn't quite the same you know and and, and in fact dennis rodman's talked about that like after the pistons won their like their first uh, or their their two championships back to back in 89 90 he said 91 guys were just different they were like you know I'm cool. I've got, I've got some championships now. So, um, you know, that, that's the other thing about Jordan is just like at that, at that point of his career, he still wanted that championship as that number six, as badly as he wanted number one, yep. because uh, you know, he just, once he gets to that stage in that moment, he's not content with not giving it his all and, and, and trying to get the win. 
And there's there's two ways to kind of look at it when when you do win like that. You know, it's either you're you're joyful or you're happy, or there's a sense of relief. And and I think against Indiana Pacers, it was it was more so the sense of relief, just given how hard that test was. And then uh, yep. obviously with Larry Bird, you know, having having his battles with MJ back in the day, and then and then to be coaching against MJ in this situation. And and, and I love that little interaction just after the game when uh, when Larry and uh, uh, and MJ, you know, think. You know the roles may have changed, but uh, but the, the guys certainly haven't. What, what did you make of that uh, that little jibe in the uh, in the corridor, Roger? Yeah, yeah. He almost had us and made us work for our money, or that's the type of comment he made. And yeah, it's just cool, like just the way that they're um, able to approach each other after the game. You know, they're just out there pushing, battling, and and then just to see each other like waiting for their their press, they're all high fiving and and chatting. You know, just how tough that battle was, and then Carl Malone goes onto the bus. To you know, congratulate the Bulls boys for winning again. You know that's that's so you know real cool to see from from a from a fan's point of view that these guys are out there battling and um, ch- I'm cheering them on and then seeing them afterwards that they're all just you know they're just all there for the love of the game and they all enjoy just being around each other and you know that's that's the way it should be. You know, should put the battle out on the court and and leave the the fun to to afterwards. And I know remember Jordan used to used to always go when we're playing away. The heels go and have um golf games with the opponents or go to dinner with the opponents and it's cool just to see that you know it's all for the love of the game and and it's been good it's cool to watch yeah the thing about the, the larry bird interaction i thought was so cool because again bird was you know obviously a different type of player but he was that clutch guy that trash talker yeah. that guy who would you know say things and then go out there and back them up and and, and hit the big shots he's a champion he's an mvp he was on the dream team you know, injuries kind of uh, ended his career a little bit earlier. But I, I, I think he looked at Michael and was like, you know, that was me before Michael, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, and he, you know, he knows that his team fought really well and battled hard. But he also, I think, could relate to Michael just being the one that got his team over the line. And because Larry did that with Boston, you know, they were, they were against the Lakers early on when they were battling against the Magic and the Lakers. Larry was the one who sort of separated those teams when uh, when the when the Celtics picked up their three championships in the '80s. So um, it's just cool when you see athletes at that level. You know, they they know they know they acknowledge each other and they understand. Like, yeah. yep, you know, you're going to win some of these games, you're going to lose some of them. I mean, Michael certainly won more than he lost, but uh, but Larry understood and respected that. Like, you know what? Like, Michael was just too good for us. Yeah, and you know the. The ten-hour, I, I guess, extravaganza. Um, yeah, for me, it definitely lived up to the hype. You know, it was it was it was everything that I thought it was was going to be. I mean, it, it very much, you know, was more of a, I mean, less so analytical, but more just kind of telling the story. And I think I think they did a fantastic job of of, of taking you back, you know, to that time and, and and seeing what the players were truly like with each other, and, and also just the era uh, in general, and, and and sort of just being put in the in the time machine back there. Um, I guess I'll, for, for both of you guys, I'll start with you, Roger. When you kind of look back at the whole body of work and the and, and the ten episodes, what's what's the thing I guess you take away from from watching this documentary, whether it be something about the Bulls or, or Jordan specifically? Yeah, the the biggest thing for me was um, uh, was mainly on on Michael Jordan and his his focus and drive to to do everything but win. You know, he was doing everything to get the win, and he was doing. Um, and he was making the, the players around him better. And I go right back to the early series where he talks about he doesn't he was winning the MVPs and he was winning all these individual awards, but he didn't feel like a true champion until he won championships. And like Lee's saying, that's that's what separated all the players. And there's so many good players that come and go. But once you win the championship, that's when you truly, you know, stamp your mark on the game. And and the way that he done it constantly and to live in that elite world, that's what that's what really inspires me. How how can I, in my, in my world today, have take his drive and put in my game? And how can I make p- players around me better? And as an as an athlete on my sport, I'm always trying to find ways to be better. And this docker came at a perfect time because we're in a unique time right now where COVID-19 has forced us to, to do different things. So how can I keep the drive and how can I keep my players' drive? So this docker has been everything and more and, you know, really enjoyed the the whole series and, yeah, MJ's mindset is just unbelievable, and I reckon if he sells this, um, replays this in a couple of years, it'll just sell off again because it's it's just crazy. And what about for yourself, Lee? What's uh, what's one big takeaway you took out from this uh, this documentary? 
Well, I, I guess, um, I mean, overall, fantastic. You know, really well put together, great storytelling. I, I thought we were going to see a little bit more behind the scenes stuff. You know, I mean, we saw some, but I, I sort of was expecting to see uh, you know, some more of those intimate moments in the locker room where Jordan's just being a dude, you know, where he's not sort of in front of the cameras for, you know, for TV purposes or, or talking business. You know, I thought we were going to see more just a, what he was like just dealing with his teammates. Um, because, you know, so for me, you know, living through those championship years, like it was, it was a great recap, you know, nine and 10 were more about, I think, just sort of recapping what happened and how he uh, got the second three-peat going. So it was great to watch it. You can never get um, enough Jordan highlights and a Jordan uh, and Bulls, um, you know, videos and things like that. But I just sort of wanted to see a little bit more, like I really wanted to see and hear from his wife, Juanita. You know, he was married to her for, um, you know, 18 years and, of course, the mother of his first three children because, you know, when, you, when you're married, you know, your wife is still the person who knows the most intricate details of how you're feeling and the moods and the ups and downs. And, you know, I understand they got divorced and, and perhaps there's, uh, and Jordan was behind this doc. So he was like, I don't want her talking. So I understand that. But I think from an outsider, it would have been like, I would love to know what it was like when, you know, he was, he was going through those gambling um, issues there where he was out gambling and the NBA was called into it. And then of course the, the tragic passing of his father, how Michael sort of dealt with that would have been really interesting to hear from the wife um, at, you know, Juanita at the time, because those are the sorts of things she could have, she could have shed some more light on just the person he was rather than, you know, the fierce competitor that we know he is, you know, and the teammate that he is at times where he's, where he's, you know, he's, he's tough on his other teammates, but I want to know what the father, Michael Jordan was like, the husband he was like, the friend he was like, that again, someone only really like a wife has that access to, you know, and, and his kids were very young. So they probably, you know, I think, you know, when they, when they talk about it, like it's hard for a seven or eight year old kid to sort of really elaborate too much on what his dad was like as a, as a father at the time. But, um, but again, I think people who were super in, close to him and, and really knew him down, down to, the, to the bone could have been able to provide even just some more information that uh, I think a lot of people would have been interested to hear about. For sure, for sure. I mean, we did see uh, see his kids pop up, um, you know, at the end for the first time in uh, in in the episodes in in, in nine and ten. And, and you know, to your point, Lee, it, it was quite interesting. You know, even even just hearing from their perspective, because as, as young kids, you obviously don't really know that your dad's Michael Jordan. But obviously, with the the benefit of hindsight and and, and everything we know now, even, even still, just getting that little insight uh, from from his three kids there, I did, did think was uh, was quite interesting. All right, guys, I think that's all we've got time for today. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us. Uh, Lee, of course, you can find all of his work over at The Athletic and on the No Dunks, on the no Dunks podcast, rather. Thanks again for joining us today, Lee. Thanks very much for having me, guys. A lot of fun, as always. And, uh, and Roger, good luck with the, uh, with the continued preparations for the NRL season that is coming back on May 28. I hope everything goes well, and uh, uh, we'll certainly be watching. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the chat. Uh, take it easy, guys, and we'll... Uh, uh, I'm probably going to go back and watch the, uh, the, the 10 episodes through right now. <laughs> uh, thanks again, guys.